So hello everyone, welcome to the fifth session of Facebook Live AMA series hosted by Inc. 42. This is Pallav from Inc. 42 team and we are live from Chennai today. Um, our today's guest uh, is a very special person. Um, he's a strong believer of Buddhist philosophies and he's on a relentless pursuit to build an institution uh, that will become the thriving ground for technology innovation and uh, a catalyst for positive social transformation. His company employs more than 5,000 people who have collectively built 38 software products, over 55 mobile applications, and is being used by over 30 million people worldwide in almost 200,000 organizations. Impressive numbers, right? But here's the icing on the cake. His company has never taken any outside investor money and has been profitable from the first year of, of its operations and continues to do so even 21 years uh, till today. Very honored um, to welcome Sridhar Vembu, founder and CEO of Zoho. Uh, welcome to the show, yeah. Sridhar. Thank you. Um, Very happy to be here. All right. So let's let's do it in uh, like two sessions. First, I'll take 15 minutes of your time for a couple of questions, and then we'll start taking questions from the audience. Sure. Um, so everyone who's joining us right now, um, you can drop in your questions in the comments section uh, for Sridhar, and we'll be taking them up very soon. So, Shreeza, first, let me congratulate you on the launch of Zoho One. 38 products combined in one suite. Um, that seems like your team has achieved quite a complicated task, right? Yeah. Um, so, congratulations on that. So, tell us, like, when did this idea of creating a, a suite came into your mind? And, um, you know, as at the moment, Google, Microsoft, and all the bigger companies, they are trying to figure out this uh, integrated approach. Mm -hmm. And you have already leapfrogged in, in that, uh, you know, in that side. So, how, like, do you think this is going to be the moment where Zoho will teach others how to lead and what to do in the market? I won't uh, presume to teach Microsoft or Google. They know what they're doing. All right. But uh, what we had this whole Zoho one in mind for over 10 years now. So the very first product we launched in Zoho, which was our Zoho Writer, a product that was about 12 years, 30, almost yeah, 12 years ago. Even at that time, it was obvious that we are not going to start stop with the word processor. Right? Obviously, even when you do a word processor, it suggests itself. All the other stuff is suggesting itself. And we diligently set out to develop a full suite. And along the way, we also used this as the company itself grew. In fact, when Zoho was born, we probably had about 350, 400 people in the whole company. When the Zoho.com division was launched, today that's 5,000. That growth process also has helped the Zoho suite product suite to grow. Because we have a, now an audience to test it, debug right. it before we launch. Every product goes through like a anywhere from a month to three months, six months of internal trial before we actually launch in public. So all of that is how we have built it. And it was obvious that it has to be packaged together fully as a coherent operating system. That's why we call it the operating system. And that was there, the vision was there, and it just took this long to get it all right. All right. So, perfect. Um, so, like Zoho started back in 1996 when I was in first grade in school. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a, a long journey for journey, you, yeah. 21 years. So, when you look back at the journey, when you first started the company, uh, when it was when it used to be called Advent Net and um, and up till now, what have been some of the highlights of of this journey of this journey that you remember distinctly? Yeah, so if you look at the twenty one year old journey of the company itself, I mean, Zoho dot com is now about twelve years running. Uh, that we went through an initial, the dot-com bubble. Right. You may have heard about yeah. it. I mean, I don't know if you were born. Yet, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So that was the a period of you know, almost hyper growth. Mm. Uh, there was just the money <laughs> this, the flying through every right. thing. You, can, right. you just have to like stand outside and catch money. That's what <laughs> it looked like at that time for a period, right? Raining money. And then the bust, yeah, it was raining money, as they say. And then, of course, the whole bust arrived. Right? That right. was like... That was true for about a brief period, two years, and then the big bust. So those were very uh, educational moments. And you learned that, you know, you never want to take good times for granted. You know, there will be hard times, and you have to go through all that. So that was a 
going through that boom and the bust was a very major educational moment. And then we decided to move aggressively into the cloud as of about 2003, 4. And 5 is when we actually launched Zoho Writer. The Zoho.com domain it was actually acquired sometime in 2003. Okay. That's when we acquired it, right, From uh, for about $5,000. Okay. And then we launched the products, and we always had a series of products in mind. And that uh, I liked was when there is a, when Google also entered the market. Mm. Like Google wasn't there in the office suite online. They entered the market, and we realized that just as having a direct competition in the office suite against them was going to be a losing proposition. We decided to quickly get our business app strategy right, that is CRM and all of that. Okay. And I remember distinctly thinking. It'd be tough to compete with Google, but it's not that tough to compete with Salesforce. Okay. So we said, okay, we'll compete with them instead. That's how we, we actually, essentially, our strategy turned around on a dime and we moved aggressively in CRM. And that became our, actually, our blockbuster success. That okay. became the mainstay of Zoho.com. While we continued the R&D on Office, we never actually gave up on it, just that we knew it would be a much tougher game. And this is a hallmark of a kind of a bootstrapping approach here. We knew that if you had just stuck to Office Suite and tried to market our way out of the difficulty of having Google and you know, such a large player as Google present, mm. we would have spent a you know, billion dollars in marketing without a lot to show for. But by building, finding other opportunities, CRM in particular, we were able to then carry forward the R&D and build a business along the way. And then this whole thing has come together now as a, as a full suite. Okay. Um, I think, uh, let me come to Zoho University now. Uh, a lot of people do not know about Zoho University uh, right now. Um, you take in students directly after school. Um, you teach them to develop world-class software products in less than 24 months. Mm -hmm. And then you take them in Zoho. Uh, and I think 15% of, uh, of your workforce yes. uh, comes from Zoho University, mm -hmm. right? So, like, it has created tremendous amount of um, new job prospects, at least, here where, where Zoho University is operational. So do you think this the same model can be applied in other cities as well? And do you plan to do that? Uh, completely. In fact, uh, now we do Zoho University in Chennai. We also have an active Zoho University program in Tenkasi, okay. our other office. Uh, Chennai now this year may be about uh, 65, 70 students, while Tenkasi has about maybe 35, 30, 35 students, somewhere in that range. So... That's how the split is. It can very much work in other places as well. Zoho itself, we have not, we have been kind of disciplined about how many development centers we open, primarily because I have always declared that I don't know how to split development centers across a lot of wide geographies, lots of distributed development. Mm -hmm. So we try to keep it in a concentrated only a couple of places now. Right. We may think about opening additional ones, but right now it's just too many now. Okay. And we are right now thinking about AP as a location for okay. subsequent development. So, all right. And how did you come up with this idea to to create Zoho University and and you know uh, get these talented school students and then train them to become world class professionals? Like how how did this idea came to you? Well, it's a common observation in our business that uh, your grades and uh, or particular educational background and what, uh, uh, how you do on the job, they don't actually correlate very well. Mm. Mm. Lots of people with uh, you know, not so stellar academic records actually do well on the job. Yeah. And vice versa. I mean, people with outstanding uh, edu you know, educational credentials don't necessarily do well on the job mm. either. So these things are commonplace observations. A lot of people observe, have observed it. It's not like we were the first to notice it. But we were thinking, how do we make that part of our hiring recruitment process. That thing that you know, how do you make it part of your process? So then we decided, let's try an experiment. We don't come up with immediately, we discovered a truth here and we are going to do this big way. We, let's try an experiment. We you know, took six kids and this was what, 13 years ago. And that program has just grown and grown. Now it's 120 kids a year, 110, 120 kids a year now. So that's pretty impressive actually. Um, all right. so. Another question uh, would be that 
every company uh, has their own culture right and zoho being a bootstrap company has a is going to have a very different culture from yeah. uh, a company of the same size which has a lot of outside investor money right so um can you tell us like what are the core philosophies and principles of of zoho culture and um how, more importantly how do you preserve this culture yeah. when you grow from a few hundred employees to more than 5000 people first of all zoho we don't think of it just as a company it's also a community mm-hmm. inside and which means that there is a we place a lot of importance on not only hiring people but keeping them for the long haul because it's a I don't like this culture of you know every three years you're replacing the entire employee base, right. which is typical in a lot of companies. So we actually have a model where our philosophy is we hire to keep people, and of course people are free to leave. Right. But we really hope that we can keep people, and that creates a culture where that itself makes it possible for us to not adopt a lot of formal processes. so you can actually do things without the heavy process and so that is our uh, uh uh model so the culture of holding on to people long haul and we have managers who been here 15 years 18 years right and that's critical to the companies yeah culture. arvind told me he has been here yeah. for 17 arvind years arvind has been yeah yeah exactly and that's very typical actually in the company so that's just pretty right. good yeah and that creates a continuity of culture that creates a certain in fact I don't know without that type of continuity I don't know if you can even call something a culture. You cannot replace people every year two years. I mean a, a, a bus does not have a culture. Yeah. Every night there is a different set of travelers on it. So right. it doesn't have a culture, right? Right. right? So that's what I call it. Are we, are we going to be a bus or are we going to be a community? Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good analogy. Yeah. Awesome. So um I think we can start taking in questions from the audience now. Yeah. So Ajay Pradeep is asking have you fired any employees from your company for low performance Uh yes it happens we try actually we fire slowly I mean we don't we're not a company that is just quick on the trigger mm-hmm. we don't just fire a person just because today we you know we wake up and think this person should be fired mm-hmm. we actually give up uh, plenty of opportunities in fact we try to pe- move people around the radio job disciplines find the match for them find a match for their talents for their passions so only in rare cases do we fire but we do we do sometimes you have to fire so. right sometimes <laughs> necessary yeah. right okay yeah so as a uh, nikhil john is asking as a new saas company how did you first get your first 10 customers in a new market for example usa yeah so it's this is true for any new product we launch i mean our zoo sign which launched 3 weeks ago it's the same thing right we always have that same thing of how do you get customers to a new product you launch that's true even for zoho so what we do is we in our case we now have a base of large customers so we can maybe we'll send them an email or email campaign to to google ads mm-hmm. to all of the traditional methods you use the one thing key to understand is if you are in a hyper crowded market where there are the 100 vendors and you are the 101st vendor it is going to be a little bit hard right right so you have to you have to find what is your differentiation what is currently lacking what is better about your solution that's true for anyone that's true for zoho too like it's just because we have the zoho brand doesn't mean we launch a new product in a new market suddenly a million customers will flock to us that won't be true we have to still demonstrate what is better about our product right why they should pick our product versus the competition that's the same thing that applies to any startup so if you can have a good answer to the question you will be able to find those 10 100 1000 5000 customers so that's the key perfect you shukla is asking what according to you zoho's future look like well we are really uh betting big on the whole operating system for business right so idea and it comes from a passionate internally held belief i'll, I'll look at how zoho corp uses our suite mm. our employees need a tool they just go use it right right they don't have to ask permission and they just use it and there may be you know administrative boundaries like accounting data is not visible to everyone all of that but still if somebody needs a tool they can go and use it we have always wondered how do we extend that level of freedom we have with our own software right. to our customers right so that's how the operating system was born right. so it's really how we use the product we have tried to extend that same privilege to our customers in a and 
I always ask, would I pay that price and be on it? Absolutely. That's that's a that's a price that though a corp would be very happy to pay for our own this thing. And if right. we didn't exist, we would pay for that. Right. 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 So that's why uh, I that's that's how I decided that. That's right. Perfect. Um, why Zoho one? Why did you decide to forego conventional vendor pricing price strategy? Yeah. Strategies like add-ons, updates, renewals. Right. That's a good one. So again, the same thing that I said. We look at how we want to use the software. Hmm. Would we like to go to you know Microsoft or Hover to ask for permission for everything? And when we ask for an add-on, there is a price, there is negotiation, there is seats, all that involved. Hmm. We don't like to do business that way. We would not want to be treated that way. So that's why we try to make it as simple as possible for our customers. Right. Open up the entire suite, keep the price very nominal, very uh, clean. Right. Then their entire, all the employee base is there. They can use whatever products, over mix they like. So, so a follow-up on that, um, like earlier you, you had, you like all your products have been selling separately. Now you have combined them together and you, wouldn't this affect on your revenues in some way? Uh, they still are sold separately. So customers who want only one of our products or a couple of them, they can still buy them. The same, whatever the arrangements that existed mm -hmm. will continue to be true. We don't expect that to you know make any big change there. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of those customers will move to Zoho One. Okay. And we are happy for them to do that. We have analyzed the revenue impact. If anything, in the worst case, the impact would be marginal. Okay. And we just, in other words, the customer would pay us similar to what they were paying, but they'll enjoy a lot more product. Okay. Which is good. I like that. <laughs> Checked in as a event SaaS company out of Bangalore. We have around 35 clients as of now. What should be our plan to increase the client base? So this is, a, I address this, where you have to first find what is your differentiation in terms of your product. Differentiation in terms of the product features, maybe in terms of integration, in terms of pricing, or in terms of maybe you have a special access to some markets, or geographic mm -hmm. differentiation, maybe you have a concentration in a particular market that is you know, harder for other vendors to achieve. Any of those, some there could be ten different dimensions in which you have a differentiation. That is how we always do it. We know, or, or there may be though. Know, sometimes you are in a hyper growth market where there's not a lot of players. Mm -hmm. Then you can luck out that way. But for a lot of companies, that's not the case. Right. So you have to actually work towards finding that differentiation, differentiation and then communicating it. Right. And that's where a lot of challenges for any company. Uh, a, a common theme of question that I'm seeing here is that a lot of people uh, are probably asking, uh, how, like, if they want to uh, join Zoho, what, what, like, what qualities do you, um, like, or, or the company looks for in the potential hires when yeah. you? Yeah. So we, again, we disregard formal credentials for the most part. In fact, we are going to just start a hiring campaign where we, our radio ads say. Zoho itself, we don't care if you have a degree, we can apply. That's part of our ad, now hiring, recruitment, ad soon. So we, because we want to change the way these things are done. You know, we know that it really doesn't matter what grades they got. In five years, nobody will care anyway. Right. But then why do we still pretend as though it matters when they are hiring? Right. So we are going to specifically state in our ad, radio ad, you can apply to Zoho without a degree. We don't actually care. If you have a degree, it's fine. but. We are not going to require it. So that's perfect. So everyone who wants to uh, join Zoho, you have a very good opportunity coming up. Um, okay. Do you only cons recruit from the best universities? Yeah. Actually, the opposite. Uh, I believe we don't go to the... I don't believe we have ever gone to IAM or ISB or IIT. Nothing against them. I come from IIT. If I had some... I'm prejudiced against IIT, then I have to be prejudiced against myself. Right. So IIT students are welcome to apply to Zoho. We just don't go there because I always said that we want to hire people uh, for whom our existence makes a difference. What I mean is if we disappear tomorrow, our employees, current employees will miss us. IIT students will find a job anyway. Mm -hmm. So they won't miss us. They don't, we, don't, we don't need to exist. So why not make our existence matter to someone? That's a good way to think about it. I mean... Always think if we didn't exist, who would miss us? Right. They are the ones you matter the to you to whom you matter the most. Right. So then work towards that. I mean, they are your natural audience for either hiring or customers or whatever. Right. Um, 
Nilima is asking, are you planning to use AI or machine learning for enhancing yeah. Zoho functionality? We are, as a matter of fact, we are already doing that now. We launched Zia about eight months ago. That's actually proving to be, you know, uh, well received by customers. We are expanding the scope of it across our product range. Zia has actually initially launched in CRM first. Mm -hmm. Now it's going into Zoho One in the next rev of it. So there's a lot more coming on that front. Awesome. We have a a strong labs team mm -hmm. that where we are pursuing uh, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, natural language processing, all of those products. Okay. So. Um, and Shubham Srivastava is asking, where do you think the next disruption in SaaS solutions lies? Voice, AI, VR, and why? I try not to prognosticate all of these. I mean, <laughs> if somebody actually knows all this, they're not telling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's not... I honestly, any of the above or all of the above, okay, mm -hmm. potential. So you got to observe and and respond quickly. Sometimes you are lucky and you get it early. Sometimes you maybe ignore something and that becomes big. Mm -hmm. You can get it late. Right. I mean, it's, uh, for example, there's a famous episode where Facebook initially believed that even on the mobile, the UI would be HTML based. Mm -hmm. So they didn't invest heavily in native apps. And they quickly, you know, once they realized native app is the way to go, they quickly, of course, caught up. Today, 87% of their revenue is coming from their native app, not from the web. So that's something where they actually initially, maybe the first six months or a year, they missed that trend, maybe a year, mm -hmm. but they caught up quickly. Right. So like that can happen to the best of companies. So you don't, you, in other words, if you are, depending on your business success on your ability to foretell the future, None of us are astrologers. <laughs> so. Awesome. So Shweta is asking, Zoho One is envisioned as one-stop solution that assists business in various operations. Um, is it challenging to offer support for so many applications? We already offer support for all those applications. Okay. So each of our products is now separately sold and mm -hmm. it has customer, active customer base, including HR, or recruitment, finance, marketing automation. All of them have customers. So we offer support. Now what we are doing is creating a concierge so that a customer can come to one one window for support. Right. And we will pull together all the relevant resources to offer them the support. Right. That is what we are doing with Zoho One. So minimum work for your customers. Exactly. Even if it is right. more for you. Oh, yeah. Right. Sushil is asking, uh, how do you see enterprise SaaS products scaling in countries like India where there are extreme challenges in the way technology is yeah, perceived? Yeah, this is a really good one. There's no, I mean, five, six years ago, Nobody would have thought the smartphone would take off this right. big in India. And now it has. Yeah. So likewise, broadband is, adoption is spreading fast. There are structural forces, right? Right now, take GST as an example. A lot of retailers who thought, would think of themselves as tech-phobic or not tech-savvy mm. now have to embrace the tech because right. that's the best way to do GST. I mean, if you have a cloud, I mean, you have a broadband connection, you, are, you know, if you are in a cloud-based mm -hmm. provider, you can just click every just uh, submit your GST report and that's done. Right. Everything is collated together in the back end and submitted. But if you didn't have it, if you had a paper-based ledger, it's a lot more involved. Right. So in a sense, all these are in the same way going digital, cashless, all of these, or bringing you know smartphones, apps, all of that into the mix. And so naturally then people have a, develop a, you know affinity to other cloud-based apps. Right. So that is how I think it's going to happen. In other words, it's not merely a a marketing challenge for a company like us, though it is to some extent, it is also a, a cultural adoption across the country, and you have the right that way of cultural adoption. Right. So, how has your IIT education helped you in your entrepreneurial journey? That's a good one. I honestly, because I studied electrical engineering in IIT, and I was, uh, I had good grades, but I wouldn't consider myself a good student. There's a difference between the two, right? You over the years, I mean, particularly in the Indian system. Smart students learn how to game the system. I was one of those. So where, you know, I mean, in any test, you know roughly what, you have to predict the examiner's mind. Right. That's what a right. test taking is, yeah. really. Yeah. It's not It's not about whether you learn the subject or not. Right. You got to know what is going to come in the test. And that's, that's your, uh, you know, that's how you score, right? Yeah. But, you know, you get tired of it, actually, after some time, you know, what's the, what's the point of this, right? right? That's not education, actually. Right. True. But, so I... So he said, I had good grades. If you looked at my transcript, you would have said I, I was a good student, but I wasn't really. I mean, I wasn't learning. 
you know, as much as my grades would have indicated. Mm-hmm. So essentially, I had to adopt a new mindset when I came to this. I I had to let go of the whole, you know, my entire past. And in fact, I remember I said, I never used my PhD, you know, I never put doctor to my name because I said, I've burnt my PhD. I don't want to, I mean, I have repudiated the past in a way, right? I don't want to look back at it. Part of it is because I, you know, I entire, my entire thought process about this changed. Mm. And now I'm much more experiential and experimental. And as opposed to sort of, there is a theory and methodology and process here, right. it's much more experiential. Right. You are learning by doing all the time. And that was, I, you know, in that sense, I don't believe that I ate education or for that matter, my Princeton education was that helpful. On the other hand, you know, you you learn to write. I mean, you know, I write a PhD thesis. Now I write a blog post. They are different subjects, but right. you still are writing. Right. So in that sense, that may be, may be useful a little bit. But it's nine years to spend to learn writing skills is not worth <laughs> nine years. Right? So, okay. Okay. It's not the good ROI for nine years. So. Okay. Sonia Swarup Chaksi is asking, hey. tech guys move around frequently for faster, higher salary hikes. How do you manage to nurture them for years? That's a good one. It's actually a culture. It comes down to your culture. Uh, Tech guys move around a lot because all the companies look indistinguishable to them, right? I mean, company A, company B, it all looks the same. What's the difference? If they pay you more, why not leave? Right. But if you have a strong culture that people can identify with, in fact, I ask, this is how I, I phrase the question. Look at things people do voluntarily on their own time without money involved. Why do they do those things? Why do they, why does somebody go, you know, maybe spend a weekend volunteering in something? Right. Whether it's uh, maybe spiritual, maybe it's sports, whatever, photography, anything. Mm-hmm. Why do they do those things? They identify with it. It's right. not, they're obviously not doing it for money. In fact, they're maybe spending money on it. So if a job does not create that identification, then you are going to have attention. No matter how much you pay, actually. Pay is not, in other words, pay is only a, you know, part motivator. And as they say, the old saying, man does not live by bread alone, right? right? So, if you are trying only to motivate a person with money, it will fail at some point. It will fail. It has to be, there has to be a broader meaning to it. Right. And that comes to the question of culture, all of that. So, right. that is what, I believe that is how you, you have to do this. And if you, if you don't do this, and then you start blaming, oh, people are leaving because they are greedy or this and that, I always have this way. I'd say it's like an Advaitic principle here. The world is a reflection of yourself in a way. What I mean by that is, if you are optimistic and you think the best of people, maybe you get the best of people. If you think the worst of people, people live up to your, exactly your expectations and, and you, know, the worst, you get the best of people, worst of people. Right. So you have to actually, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and cheerful. I don't, I don't look at people as, oh, suspicious, greedy, and this person, all that, nothing. So, were you always this optimistic or did you yeah. develop that? I you... probably developed it over the years. And, and how I did know, you do that? I learned that, you know, if you are an optimist or a pessimist, you're going to get exactly what you believe. So, you might as well be an optimist. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you're a pessimist, you're going to, you got to realize you're pessimist. Yeah. So, why not be an optimist then, you know? It's free. Right. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel at any point we had PE, VC funds, you would have growth act very early um you know it's hypothetical it's hard to say but i never actually wanted to grow hack that way so that is the answer it's not the objective was not immediately how to grow the fastest the mostest all that the objective was how to first put food on the table be sustainable and take it uh, you know a journey it was not really a tomorrow we have to get to an exit right. that was not a, never a goal so that that never was a motivation for in the, in the current context, I would uh, ask that there are a lot of product companies that are coming out of India right now. Um, have you seen any common thread or any common problems that you like generally see when you when you read about Indian startup ecosystem um, that, you know, the, like all these companies are doing this part, you know, maybe wrong or this, this, this could be improved or maybe done in a different way. Uh, do you see those kind of things happening? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is... Maybe an excessive worship of 
credential in hiring. Okay. Uh, and people want the marquee talent from famous schools. That's one. Already I see a lot of companies fall for that. They will justify it as we want people to hit the ground running. Somehow we don't. So it's always that same mindset, right? We are a treadmill. That's that's the right. hit the ground running means actually you are you are running going to run a treadmill right. always. So I reject the treadmill. We are not in a race against someone. Mm-hmm. In fact, we are only in a race against ourselves. Right. True. I mean, actually, Steve Jobs said it best, right? The thought that we are surely going to die is the most liberating thought in the world. I mean. 50 years, 100 years, none of this will matter. Nobody will watch this video, right, in 100 years. So why obsess so much about all this? Right. And that's why I think that it's uh, it's important that we take a moment and think about our long term, what is what do we want out of life? Right. And then align your business, your company, all over, around those things. If people did that, then they will find more meaning at work. They wouldn't have to seek that exit. And over time, they will, you know, maybe reach their goals, even maybe faster or better. But at least they'll be happier. So, Mayan Pratap asks, we should focus on the Indian customer or global customer. Well, the answer is always the same. You go where the customers are for your product, best customer. So, that could be in India, that could be globally. So, you find where it's easiest to make that sale for you. That's what I would say. Because you... You know, as a as a business, you the purpose of business is to keep to to create a customer, as right. Peter Drucker said. So, create those customers wherever you find them. They could be in Germany, they could be in Taiwan, they could be, for example, our own early customers. A good number came from Japan. Oh, so right. early on, so for you know reasons pertaining to that particular market. So go where the customers are. Right. Okay. Uh, another question that I. I've I've seen from your other interviews and um, as well that you read a lot, right? Yeah. Um, so, can you share with us like uh, two or three books that have completely changed your perspective about life, about work or anything in particular? Yeah. So, I'll maybe talk about one that is an older one and uh, that is The Road to self Talk by Hayek. It's a very important book because as he calls it, it's a meditation on liberty. But it's more than, it's thought to be a political book. But I also have found it to be, a, in a sense, uh, a book about, it, what he essentially says is, what drives a person to act? You know, that's unknowable. The intrinsic motivations are unknowable. So, the, a system that preserves the most freedom of action for people, that they call it libertarian in a sense, is the best system because you cannot predict other people's motivations which means that you have to preserve their freedom of action whatever their motivations are and only judge them by the actions not by the whatever their motivations may be okay. side. and what it means is this this actually has a profound impact on business too which is why i said i don't try to predict you know i i don't try to question people's motivations why are they leaving would they leave all of those kinds of things or are they do they have uh a good intent in mind, all of those. Mm-hmm. And why do they say this? Is there a hidden intent? Those things are unknowable. There's no point arguing about all this. Just judge by the actions and preserve a freedom of the room for that action. So that is really the road to serfdom. And more recently, I've been I've read this book uh, what's it, on AI. You know, you cannot have objectives. You cannot create, run everything by objective. This is actually uh, coming from an AI research where AI programs are goal-oriented. You have a specific goal and then you create a program to achieve that goal, right? Mm-hmm. This is a different school of AI where it says such goal, this kind of a, you, it's novelty-seeking search as he calls it, mm-hmm. that the AI program is only looking for novel ideas, not, toward, not towards any specific goal. That turns out to produce very, very interesting outcomes. So, uh, in a sense, he makes an analogy, it's a philosophy, that our life itself is like that. We are seeking some new experiences, new things. And along the way, we explore and we figure out new stuff. So that is a really powerful book. Um, so that's these are two books that I'll talk about. Uh, Karthik is saying, what do you think is a big differentiating factor for Zoho products from other similar SaaS products? Yeah, this differentiation has evolved over time, right? In 12 years ago, having something available in SaaS was a differentiator. Yeah. Because we had only installed products. Mm-hmm. 
So having a word processor that actually works uh, on the web, on the cloud, was a differentiator by itself. Then over time, we have added more and more. We have created a lot more innovations that are unique to the cloud, unique to the cloud way of doing it. So it evolves. Your differentiation has to evolve with every new release. And today, I would say it's the broadest and the deepest, most integrated suite offered as one operating system for business. That is our real differentiator today. And uh, maybe in who knows, in 10 years later, there may be five such companies, 10 such companies offering. Right. Then we have to figure out what is our special secret sauce there. So right. that's, so, uh, no, business is always a, a constant quest for differentiating yourself. Right. If you don't, you eventually are bypassed by you know, companies that have a better idea than you. So. Yeah, was high customer churn ever a problem for Zoho? Uh, customer churn has two things. One is, if you look at very small customers, typically there's a lot of churn. Because simply because the, the as uh, Paul Graham once put it, for a very tiny company, existence is a matter of opinion often. Meaning, does the company continue to exist or not is uh, sort of a, you know, undesirable thing there. So there's a lot of uncertainty in a very small one or two or three person companies. And when you have a lot of those customers, then there tend to be a churn unrelated to what your product does or how well it does it. That's a, that's a kind of a baseline churn in very small business, micro business. Then there is a second factor, of course, is there's a lot of uh, a SaaS was new. A lot of people were what we call tire kickers. People who just come in to check things out. They really don't know what they want. They're just checking things out. And they may be seeking something like a CRM, but they don't can't articulate that, that they want a CRM. They may end up with project management right. and then decide that's not what they want and then move to something else. So that kind of churn is very common also in the tire kicking phase of uh, SaaS. Now the market is becoming more mature, so the churn has come down. It is coming down across the board. I believe that it's happening. People have more of a fixed choices in terms of what they want. Mm -hmm. So I think we are more in that phase. Uh, along the way, of course, competition is exploded. Right. In the early phase, there is less competition. Now there's a lot more competition. So now the question is not that you don't have to sell the concept of SaaS, concept of cloud. You have to tell people why you are better in than the existing solutions. Right. So. What is the future of ERP, someone asked? If you look at our suite, the operating system for business, in a way, you can liken it to an ERP, but I don't like that word because of the association, the bloat, the cost, and the sort of secretiveness of that whole thing. I mean, you cannot actually, a common person cannot access SAP or something. While you can come in in five seconds, you can see what Zoho does. Right. You can go in right. and check out every product. So those all of, for all those reasons, I don't actually use the word ERP very much. But I look at this operating system as encompassing the entire business software world, enter, entire enterprise. The other reason why this is different from ERP is here you are going customer CRM first. So you are, see, today the, the, the correct way to build an organization everybody recognizes is customer first, customer centric, right. as opposed to production centric or factory centric. Mm -hmm. That was the old model of thinking. Now you are thinking from the customer inside right. rather than your factory house outward. So the direction of the arrow is reversed. So our suite is built that way, with CRM centric. And then the second thing is traditional ERP is not collaborative. Mm -hmm. You don't have, you don't put in all the chat, all of the social tools, all of that right. in the ERP context. Right. Here in our customer centric, the social, all of those and the collaborative tools are very much a fabric of it. Right. So that's how this operating system is different from ERP. But it will eventually, I believe, grow to supplant the ERP. Yeah. Zoho is a big company. How do you make sure everyone in the company is aligned with the company's vision and doing, doing their responsibility? Mayank Pratap. It's a good question. A lot of it is communication. In fact, uh, our tools like Zoho Connect and the Zoho Chat or now Click, they all grew up in that milieu where the need to communicate. I am the probably the most frequent poster on our Connect tools and I comment and I respond to a lot of things like this. In fact, I conduct open house sessions inside. We don't yet use video, but we use the actually the Q&A format, like more like Reddit right, than right. like this. But it's very popular, exceedingly popular. In fact, we we have another 
innovation in Zoho that's there in the Zoho Connect product. Anybody can use it. We have more customers can use it. We actually allow employees to ask questions anonymously. Oh, nice. So that's that's a huge hit. To you or to anyone? In the to any, to, I mean, and I conduct open houses to me. Okay. But other managers conduct their own open houses and to mm -hmm. them as well. Okay. Or within a team. There may be a team of 30 people and questions could be coming anonymously. Right. It's a lot of fun to watch, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> because people become more fearless. Right, when exactly. you, re you remove that thing. Yeah. And, and that is crucial to our culture. Actually, that's one tip I will give to any company. Try to conduct anonymous open houses. Okay. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Abhishek Jain asks, can Zoho develop a system for our vendors and our company can interact with Pan India basis? Well, we are going to announce a program as part of Zoho One. I'm kind of uh, pre-staging it now, right now for customers to tell us what more apps do they need to run their business? What should we be doing for them more? Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that those will be already included in their Zoho One pack. That means that, in effect, the price they pay is already fixed. They know what they're paying. So they might as well ask us, hey, you might as well solve this problem for me and include it in this. Right. So we are going to do that. Uh, definitely, we will open that up. That's right. Uh, so, Mishra Pritam is asking how to change the mindset of small and medium businesses from pen and paper to SaaS. Yeah, this is actually the cultural transformation. This is not. This is beyond the, you know, the kind of any single vendor here. I mean, it's not just some Zoho can do something to change this mindset. But really, in our country, the the changes that are happening, the penetration of the smartphone. We are going to have what uh, 100, 150 million smartphones a year mm -hmm. now. And in the next 10 years, that means that maybe more than a billion people right. have smartphones right. in this country, right? That by itself, that means apps. That means they're used to all of those things. So you make your SaaS work well on Android or iOS right. as apps, then naturally there is a, an increased you know, adoption for it. Mm -hmm. So all of these, I think, are going to make a difference. And then the government is doing its best by right. trying to move all transactions to digital mm -hmm. and then trying to, you know, of course, GST itself. All of these, I think, is uh, we can predict a massive upsurge in mm -hmm. SaaS adoption, cloud adoption. So that's what we are betting on. Right. So um, coming to the, to the government side of it, like uh, government has been trying to do a lot for startup ecosystem in India, especially. Um, have you had any sort of interaction with any government officials or, or companies in the US who are trying to venture into India and there are like your views on what the government is doing in terms for, for startups and do you think there's more scope to it? Do you think whatever is uh, happening right now, uh, we need to adopt that first and then, you know, maybe think later about improving further? Uh, what are your views on that? So if you see my own view right now on the whole GST, hmm. take that as an example, it's clearly a step change, a huge step change. Right. Millions of businesses have to go on, on it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, uh, initially, there are a lot of hiccups along the way, but the commitment is very clear. The government wants, first, tax compliance culture. Second, therefore, you know, by making it a compliant culture, we can make taxes fairer and even lower for everyone. Right. But if some other people or a lot of the people don't pay taxes at all, then they would be higher for on the rest of us who do pay taxes. Right. So I think these are all, I, 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 I am sure that these are positive changes. All of these are going to have an impact. And... Technology itself helps ensuring this transparency. Mm -hmm. And I believe that all of this means that for software vendors, SaaS vendors, there is going to be a, a, a huge market mm -hmm. coming on the next 10 to 15 years. And let's say you keep that long-term goal in mind, but in the short term, you have to still survive. So find the markets where you can actually make money today. So, uh, you know, this is the variation of the think globally and act locally. Right. Think long-term, but act short-term. Yeah, this is a good one, Naveen Kumar. Your thoughts on the impact of hiring best engineers or maybe 70 or 80th percentile engineers in a software company. I don't think of people in terms of 99th percentile or 80th percentile or something. In other words, I don't see them as label of their GRE score or their right. percentile. So it's not, or their grades or whatever, right, GPS. That's, uh, I mean, it's, in IIT there was, like, implicitly everyone knew your JE right? So there is like sort of you're carrying your JE rank on your, on your, <laughs> on your forehead or something, right? It's funny. I, I do remember you know, that, that, that always that everyone knows their JV rank. So it's not normal. 
I I don't think that's a natural culture, honestly. That's, in fact, they try to emphasize in IIT or JE rank is irrelevant. Mm. But human nature being what it is, it's not that irrelevant, right? When you are talking to a person, you are aware of their JE rank. Yeah, yeah, right. So, and that that's that's sim similar to that question. I don't like to think of people in their whatever their percentile is. Thank goodness we don't do that in Zoho. We go by the experience of what they can do on a project on a product, and if they can do an awesome job, they are promoted. That's it. So that's simple. Then we don't worry about their what are their percentile, what what. Theoretically, what there, where they would have fit in in some universe of some mythical ideal universe of software engineering. That's not our thing. All right. So uh, one question is that you know um, a lot of new startups are now cropping up. A, a lot of entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurs in India, um, but most of them, or a large section, would I would say, um, is still hesitant in bootstrapping their company, and most people like still want to. Uh, get outside investment initial early on so they can they can scale and do whatever but um, if you have to tell a new entrepreneur why you should bootstrap and maybe even how what what yeah. how would you do that like what would you tell well I'd say don't overthink it go outside your home outside here on the road and see it there's probably a coconut water vendor She's bootstrapping. There's probably a flower vendor. Mm -hmm. She's bootstrapping. Yeah. Right? Then there's a chai wala. Mm -hmm. He's bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. So they're all bootstrapping their business. Think about it. So we don't overthink it. Then you realize if the chai wala is in business, maybe I can be in business. I can, I can do it too. Right. Take the chai wala as inspiration, the flower vendor as inspiration. Then you don't worry about it that much. Mm -hmm. So I honestly, I used to think that way. I used to think of the chai wala, the flower vendor, the coconut water vendor as inspiration. I still do. So it's important to not overthink these things. Uh, let's take uh, last two questions. Raghav Shankar with the evil looking photo there. <laughs> hey Mr. Evil CEO, loving the new GST marketing and Zoho one is finally here. Kudos on that. So how do you feel the generation gap is bridged? where you get eccentric folks as opposed to your run-of-the-mill folks. Once with a sense of adventure against one who excel at following orders to the dot. How has this enabled Zoho to become better over the years? Um, again, I don't think of people as eccentric versus run-of-the-mill or people who are... Even people who may have followed orders in some other company. In Zoho, they are encouraged to think more outside the box because you create an atmosphere where they can blossom. And then they see other people. First of all, in Zoho, there is a lot of people who have asked a lot of tough questions, anonymous questions, and no repercussion. Nothing has right. been done. So then people get emboldened. They think that, you know, in this company, nobody is going to come after my job if just because I posted a tough question internally, right? So you create that atmosphere of freedom, then you will get automatically attract people to think. In other words, don't think of this eccentric versus none of the mill are some kind of a static, they are born with it. Mm -hmm. Think of it more in terms of how a behavior emerges in that environment. So we create an environment where people are allowed to be more free, I guess. Then their natural creativity blossoms. So, all right. so last question is, how do you take care of employees' well-being at Zoho? Yeah, um, again, I actually apply the rule, what would I like here? Right. I mean, I we have a school here. You know, one of the things if you're a parent is that you're always worried about where is your kid right now. Or, mm -hmm. And that's particularly when it's 5 p.m., 6 p.m., you are starting to worry, right? The school is right here on the campus. That makes it one less thing to worry about. Right. So it's an easy one. I mean, it's not a difficult one. And would we, why should we allocate our money to do this? Well, the employees are happier. Then they are actually, they are more focused on the job. They don't have to worry about where is my kid. In fact, the same way, one of the unique things in Zoho is that kids are allowed at all times in the company. At all times. You, you know, you probably go around and see a couple of kids roaming around. And of course, during school year, school time, there may be fewer. During summer vacation, there'll be a lot more here. And why do we have that policy? The same reason that it gives peace of mind to the parents if kids are nearby. Mm -hmm. And that's how human communities are, right? So as it goes back to the first thing I said, I think of the company as a community. 
not just as a commercial enterprise. Right. Once you think of it as a community, then all of these things naturally suggest themselves. Kids should be around. And the nice thing is when you see kids around, it also creates a more lively atmosphere. atmosphere right. Right. You feel happier. Kids make you happy. Right. So that's it. Perfect. Uh, so I think with that, we come to an end of this uh, AMA session with uh, Sridhar Vembu. Uh, there have been a lot of interesting answers from him, a um, lot of guidance and wisdom as well. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and thank you, Sridhar, for you. doing this. Um, you took out time. And uh, I hope Zoho One um, is a huge success. And uh, all the thank best you. with that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. We have a lot more um, AMAs coming up in near future. So stay tuned on Inc. 42 Facebook page. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.